Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that in this country, medical care contributes 10% of how well people do. We also know by all the literature that has been written that 30% is due to genetics and that 20% is due to the social and environmental factors. And more important, that 40% of how well people do depends on their behavior. So we know that where people live, where people go to school, the opportunities they get depends on whether that individual will smoke for a lifetime, will go out and play a sport for a lifetime, or sit and watch a sport for a lifetime or go out and use that insurance card to do well for themselves. And yet, we spend $3 trillion on the healthcare system, on the medical healthcare system, and we do exactly the inverse, which is to spend 7% 7, 7 of that on the technology, the medical piece and maybe 30% on making sure that we create safe neighborhoods, that we have affordable housing, that we have great schools where everyone and every child, not just specific zip codes, can have an opportunity to move up that economic ladder and be sitting in those chairs, be sitting, standing on this stage themselves. And so we know this, we know this, and we do very differently. And so today I'm going to tell you a little bit, just a little bit about my experience in the healthcare system, but also I'm going to spend some time telling you some great stories when you go out and you look beyond the disease, when you look and break those four walls of your practice, of your home, of your neighborhood, and you say, what is that person really telling me? So, my friends, I also will leave you with some takeaways. Some takeaways because each and every one of you have so much power, so much more power than actually the president, so much more power than actually the important people, politicians, to make a difference in this world. So thank you for listening. So, I came here when I was 13 years of age. Mm, sorry. Um, and from Colombia. A torn country that now, by the way, is a beautiful country. Go and visit. But I, when I came here at 13, I had no prospect of ever graduating from high school there or even being alive with the violence that was going there came here on a, one of the most snowy days, landed in Virginia, and I had no boots, no coat, very little money, and not a word of English. Yes and no is what I knew. And so my mom had three months to find a new home. She struggled. We learned that you have to pay your first month and second month, and so coming together with two months of rent was devastating for her. But I was so, so excited to be in America, to learn English, to have the opportunity to go to the most amazing schools, which I did. <laughs> and so I entered school. And within the first few days of entering school, I got a skin test. And so I thought, this is amazing. When I ever got vaccinations back home, you couldn't use your arm for like a whole month, you know? <laughs> you have so, so many vaccinations that you get. And so I thought, this is beautiful, this is America, this is wonderful. And so I went to bed that night, I woke up the next morning, paranoid, show my mom the arm, it was about this big. And my mom says, you can walk, you can talk, I gotta go to work, just make sure you have, put a long sweater, don't tell anybody, just go about your business, <laughs> and hope that your arm is there when we return tonight. But she needed to make sure, she was looking ahead for me to get an education, for me to have a different life. 
And so I went to school, and like any, I had just turned 13, so it's all about you, right? So of course, I did exactly what my mom told me not to do. I went over to the teacher and I said, look, that's all I could say in Spanish, mira, mira. And uh, the teacher ran out of the room screaming. She took me to the principal's office. The principal took me to the nurse's office. The nurse didn't even look. She just called the health department, and the health department took me to the emergency room. The emergency room admitted me, and then the police came, and then immigration came. And then it was total chaos. It was total, total chaos. Nobody ever asked and went beyond those walls. They never always, they just looked at this arm and everybody got scared. I think that, I think at that time, I think that if we had asked enough questions, people would have known that I had been vaccinated and that's the reason. We all know that now. So, that is my experience with the healthcare system and that is what my friends got me to actually choose a career in healthcare. And that's how we started Mary Center 30 years ago. We started, and I started as a nurse, working in the health department. And as I was beginning to see a lot of the immigrant women coming in in the 80s who had delivered their babies at home in Washington, D.C., because they were so scared. They were fleeing tremendous violence that was happening in Central America. I saw these women come in with their children, 15, 16 months of age, without a birth certificate, without vaccinations. And many of them came very early on with a lot of pain, tremendous pain, because they had not expelled their full placenta. So I was caring, I was caring for the symptoms. I was caring for the symptoms, but I couldn't get out of those four walls to ask people, what is your life all about? Because, you know, the fact that we got them, their kid vaccinated and the fact that they have a birth certificate did not put food on the table, did not allow them to live in peace. And I knew that so many of the women were in deportation in those days. So we decided to start Mary Center. Mary Center now is a $52 million organization seeing over 40,000 people in the district, in the region here, eight sites. And we look beyond the disease. We look at the full, full person. We embrace all that is them. Where do they live? Where do those kids go to school? And we know that children have an opportunity to have in this country compulsive education, but we know that if an adult doesn't finish high school, that their chances of ever finishing high school are never. So the school, the model that we have of education, healthcare, and social services does just that. It makes sure that our parents become their children's first teacher and that they become their best teacher. So my friends, I will say to you right now, you know, how does that happen? It happens very simple. Veronica and Edison. Veronica got admitted into the hospital. Veronica delivered her baby, and her baby got discharged with spina bifida. Spina bifida, as you know, one in a thousand in the U.S. She got discharged with this many referrals to the best, because I saw the list, to the best, to the best specialists in this region. And for months, she would pick up the phone to make those appointments because she knew enough English to make the appointment. But every single time, after they said hello was, what's your insurance? Didn't even ask her name. But month after month, she would pick up the phone to make sure that maybe there would be another answer at the other side of the, of the phone, that maybe they would ask her name, and maybe they would just give her an appointment, and she'll get there, and she would figure it out after they saw her child. But that never happened. And so she entered Mary Center. She entered Mary Center where she actually told us, and we saw the great care that she was giving to her child. And as soon as we put her hand on her hand, and said, but how are you doing? She started crying. She had lost her job, had just lost her job because she was taking such good care of Edison. And Edison was thriving under her care, but they were about to lose their home because she was about not to give up on her child. So we looked beyond the four walls, and we got her insurance, we got her a really good place for her to live, and now 
Veronica is going to open up her own child care center with the help of Bria, our partner school. She's going to open up her own child care because she has assets. Her assets are that she spent time taking care of Edison in the best way that anyone, no hospital, nobody could have taken care better than her. And so she's going to use that asset to open up her child care and be able to someday take care of one of our children if they ever have special needs. And Edison had braces, he's got special shoes, he's walking about two blocks. Now he's integrated into a school system, and her mother, his mother now has a car where she can now not only take him to appointments, but she's taking him to the beach. She's taking him to see sports and to try sports himself. He's thriving, and he has a new life. He has what Mary Center gave him was the prescription for hope. Because when people have hope, they themselves don't have to be told to get up and go to the doctor. They themselves thrive and do it, just like we do with our own children. We put it on our, that, you know, they have to have the dental care and that they have to get the physical and all of that. Our, our most resilient families do the same thing. So you ask, what can you do? What can each one of us do in the four walls that we work in? I tell you, be an advocate. You are the greatest advocates for community health centers. Right now, 51% of the people that we see are uninsured, particularly in areas outside of the District of Columbia. So, you can be an advocate. You can also get care at these community health centers. The integration of you and, other, and the people that are most resilient love to see you in, in that uh, uh, community health center. They love to see your faces. They love to interact with you. And you can give the three T's, your time, your talent, and your treasure, to communities, to the community health centers in your area. Just a plug for Mary Center, www.marycenter.org, just in case. But, um, but that's what you can do. You are the biggest advocates. I always tell the providers at Mary Center, who are just amazing, who look at the disease, but can have an opportunity to warm hand over to the social worker, to the home visitor, to the health educator, to make sure that all, the whole patient is being taken care of. So I tell them, you're the biggest advocates. You're the ones that can really tell the story. So, I have another great story. One story that really could, it's a story of so many of your parents, your grandparents, and your great-grandparents. There Jew came here from Ethiopia. He came here on a special visa because he was, the drought and the violence in Ethiopia, he could have probably not be alive today. He came here with the hope of having a new life, a start in life, that would be so wonderful. But instead found a lot of isolation, became very, very depressed, extremely depressed. And he walked into our center with his wife seven months pregnant. He couldn't find care anywhere. We were able to talk to Derju and just say, what, what, is, what is making you not get up in the morning? What is preventing you from doing that? And he said to us, you know, I love to go back to school, but there's no way. I don't have any money. I, don't, I can't even pay for my wife's prenatal care. How could I? How could I even dare think about going back to school? And in that conversation, we learned, we learned that he was an engineer in Ethiopia. He was an engineer. He was too ashamed to tell us, to tell the world that he couldn't make it in this great United States. He couldn't tell us, but he told us. It took him seven years to get an undergraduate degree and to get into the dental school at the University of Maryland. And now, Dr. Tosema works for Mary Center as one of our dentists. He provides hope. He prescribes hope. He fixes teeth, but he prescribes hope to people that come through there, whether they're Afro-Americans that have lived here a lifetime, 
whether they come from another part of the country, or whether they're the newcomers in this city that just are lonely, first job in the city. He provides hope. And he's providing hope to his family. His family, he loves his family. His family comes to Mary Center, and they love to see how his father loves life now. And so, my friends, I leave you with one more takeaway. As you walk around your neighborhood, your professional life, with your own kids, dig deep. If they're coming with a problem, ask more questions. Break those walls. Break them. Go deep. Because I can tell you that just when you do that, you will find that exceptional reception is that you've always been looking for. You will find that babysitter for your newborn that will do amazing things for you. Or you will find that next partner in your business that will flourish and make you just thrive more than you are already. And so, listen, act, go beyond those four walls. And ladies and gentlemen, you will see your life transform before your very own eyes. Thank you very much.